Hi, good evening, everyone. It's great to see you all here. Uh, I'm Professor Daniel Chua. I am the director of the Faith and Global Engagement Initiative here at the University of Hong Kong. So welcome. Um, before we start, I thought we'd do something, an experiment, a collaborative experiment together. And you have to all participate, all right? And uh, now in this experiment, you can raise your hands as many times as you like. But you have to do something. You're not allowed to sit here passively. Okay, That's the key. So uh, you don't have to raise your hands quite yet. But anyway, um, right. Uh, so the first, the first thing is, I, I, I want to do a survey, right? So I want you to raise your hands if you love work. If you love your work, please raise your hands. Oh, come on, this is the University of Hong Kong. You know, you're not here for the money, right? You're here because you love your work. Okay, raise your hands. That's not bad. That's pretty good. Okay, and then uh, I'd like you to raise your hands if you... Ha Actually, before we do this one, you, can, you have to make sure your, your boss isn't sitting. In, in here. You raise your hands if you actually hate work. Hate work. Come on, you have to be honest. You hate work. Nobody hates work. Oh, yeah, okay, some hate work. Or oh, hate studying. That also counts as work. <laughs> oh, yes, okay. <laughs> All right. What about raise your hands if you find work so so? You know, it's okay, it's boring. Just do it, right? It's something you have to do, right? Yeah, yeah, so so. Okay. All right, good. And raise your hands if you simultaneously love and hate work at the same time. That's me. Sometimes I love being at Hong Kong U, and sometimes I'm thinking, what am I doing here? And I'm thinking, all right, that's great. See, work is something you know, that we do all the time. We spend most of our lives working. And some people actually find uh, their identity in their work. And other people find meaning in their work, or work is the cause of their sense of meaninglessness. And if you're lucky and young enough to be part of, the, part of the millennial generation, then you know that you're living in the age of meaning and you're looking for meaningful work, work that would contribute to society in some form. Now, given that work is so important, it's funny that we seldom really think about it very seriously. We just do it because we have to find a job, because we have to earn some money and so on. But it is such an important thing. So it is a great pleasure and an honor for me to be able to introduce a world expert in this area, and he is none other than Dr. Brian J. Dick, Associate Professor of Psychology at Colorado State University. Now, he has written several books on this topic. He has published over 140 papers on this topic, and he's even founded, co-founded a company on this topic. So I think he is more than adequate to talk to us about this subject of work and meaning. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Brian Dick. Well, thanks everyone for coming out tonight and spending some time with us. I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about this guy. Do you recognize him? This is Sigmund Freud. He's the most famous psychologist in history. And he's famous for saying all kinds of really outlandish things and a few really wise things, too. One of the wise things that he said was this. Love and work are the cornerstones of our humanists. Do you agree with that? Love and work are the cornerstones of our humanness. I'm going to spend most of our time tonight talking about work, but I thought I'd start by talking about love, and romantic love in particular, because there are a lot of university students here, and I know how much university students appreciate receiving unsolicited dating advice. <laughs> so here goes. Now, do you recognize this? This is a famous Rorschach inkblot test. So the test itself consists of 10 cards, and a psychotherapist would show a psychotherapy client each of these cards and ask them to describe what they saw without censoring themselves. It's an ambiguous stimulus, and your response to it is thought to reveal something about the inner workings of your psyche. So what do you see here? Do you see a sadistically smiling wolf? Or do you see a pelvic bone? Or maybe two flying monkeys tearing apart a small child? Well, whatever it is you see, that's thought to reveal something about what's going on in your subconscious. Now, um, I show this because I'm going to talk to you real briefly 
about what to do on a first date. Okay? A lot goes into arranging a first date. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about what to do on a first date. There are really two main objectives. Number one, on a first date you have to work really hard to make a good first impression. And number two, you have to try hard to discern if the person you're on the date with is worth going on a second date with, knowing that they also are working hard to make a good first impression. So this is very complex. Now, it would be useful if you had a tool like a Rorschach, where you could give them something that would reveal some important information to help inform this decision. I don't, however, recommend administering a Rorschach on a first date, unless you're both psychology majors, in which case maybe it would be a fun activity. Uh, no, you need another ambiguous stimulus. So here's an ambiguous stimulus. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? So try asking this question on a first date. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, if I asked a question like this, I no longer would be trying very hard to make a good first impression. <laughs> and that is correct. But if you let a, a little bit of your inner nerd bubble to the surface and ask a question like this, the response you would get uh, would make it worthwhile because you would get key insights into the inner workings of the person that you're on the date with. Now what follows are untested hypotheses. Okay, so if at some point at Hong Kong University you have to design an independent study for psychology or sociology or something like that, I would invite you to, to try some of these out and then uh, gather your results and email them to me so I have something to substantiate what I'm about to tell you. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Now, if you ask this question and the person who you're on the date with begins talking about superhuman um, feats, physical feats, like leaping tall buildings in a single bound, or the superhuman strength of Incredible Hulk, then you're on a date with someone who is clearly either very athletic or conversely not at all athletic, and they're trying to compensate for that. Okay? This is valuable information. Now, if a person responds by talking about superpowers that involve controlling the elements, like magnetism, or the weather, like storm, then you've got someone with a very high need for control, kind of a god complex. All right? And this is really important to know in someone who you might be starting a relationship with. Okay? Very important red flags. Now, if a person talks about changing shape, like the, uh, the atom, or sorry, changing size, like the atom or Colossal Boy. Do we have any Colossal Boy fans in the audience? Americans don't know who the atom or Colossal Boy are either. Uh, it's like from the 1940s, but anyway. Um, <laughs> or if a person talks about changing shape, like Mr. Fantastic, or worse of all, taking on the form of other people, like Mystique, then you've got someone who's obviously very insecure, not comfortable in their own skin, someone who is going to be very high maintenance. This, too, is very valuable information to know on a first date. Now, if a person talks about superhuman speed, like you would get with the Flash or Dash, <laughs> then you've got um, someone who's conveying information about what they expect from the relationship about its pace and so forth. So that's also very valuable information. If a person says x-ray vision, I think it's probably pretty clear what motivation lies behind that uh, particular superpower. Now all of these superpowers that we've talked about so far have been negatives. They've been things that are not so desirable in people who you might be starting a relationship with. But it, it's not always that way. If a person talks about Batman, this is a little bit different because, as we all know, Batman didn't actually have real superpowers. He had a huge bank account, um, many years of advanced martial arts training, and access to really amazing gadgets, but no actual superpowers. That means that he was an overachiever, and the person that you're on the first date with also then is likely an overachiever, but of course 
you already knew that because after all, this person is on a first date with you, right? I'll be here all night, everybody. I'll be, okay, all right. No, I start with the, the superhero metaphor because I think it's a powerful one when we think about our work. Here's another superhero. Um, this is Peter Parker. Yes, I know it's not the updated Andrew Garfield Peter Parker. I prefer the Tobey Maguire one. Um, but you know this story. Peter Parker is kind of a nerdy high school kid, and interested in science, took photos for the school newspaper, and then one fateful day on a class trip, he gets bitten by a radioactive spider. And very quickly, he gets home and he notices some very amazing changes. He has uh, this physique that suddenly looks like he's been working out incessantly for months. He has this uncanny spidey sense. He can scale walls vertically. Suddenly webs start shooting out of his wrists. It's amazing. And he has these, uh, these really unique gifts. And part of the story is him figuring out, I have these gifts now. What am I going to do with them? Now, uh, Peter did have some options. He could have uh, gone into uh, the rest of his life as a supervillain. Uh, but let's just assume that, just like all of you here, uh, Peter didn't lie awake at night wondering how he could cause widespread human harm. He considered other options. In the actual, uh, the original comic book, uh, Peter inked a deal with a TV studio and shot a pilot in which he used some of his skills for a TV show. Uh, in the film, he entered the wrestling ring. I think he had to last three minutes in order to get 300 bucks or something like this. And if you can scale um, a cage like he could here, maybe this is a reasonable course of action. But you know how this story unfolds. Um, Peter's Uncle Ben ends up getting murdered. And um, Peter keeps thinking about his Uncle Ben and his words of wisdom. And you remember uh, his very famous lesson for Peter. He would always, um, Peter would always remind himself, with great power comes great responsibility. And ultimately, Peter, as he wrestles with this question, I have these abilities, what am I going to do with them, concludes, I'm going to spend my nighttime hours fighting the crime elements in the city. In a sense, all of us are superheroes because like Peter, you have gifts that are unique to you and you have to wrestle with this question. I have these gifts. What am I going to do with them? What am I going to do with them? You've got options and you have to ultimately decide uh, a path that's going to allow you to express those gifts, hopefully in a way that contributes something of value to the world around you. Now, all this is linked to this idea of a calling. Now, the concept of calling is an interesting one. Uh, it's one that's become, it's got a very long history, but it's one that's become quite mainstream, at least in the United States, which is where I live and work. Uh, we see this in a number of places. One of them, is uh, Monster.com, still one of the world's largest online job boards. It had as its tagline for a time, your calling is calling. You'd have to take your eyes off of Alicia Keys and <laughs> look in the upper left in order to see that. I, have, I think I have a pointer here. See, your calling is calling, which is an interesting way to put it. But anyway, uh, so Monster.com. There's also Oprah Winfrey. Uh, the cultural icon of the United States, former talk show host and media maven, uh, devoted an issue of her magazine to this topic, What's Your True Calling? And if you want to see a commencement address by Oprah, um, she gives speeches at graduation ceremonies, usually at Ivy League schools. She always tries to inspire her students to identify their calling and live it out. You see this in other places, like the Dalai Lama's book, The Art of Happiness at Work. He devotes the better part of a chapter to exploring this issue of a calling. 
and ties it to the Buddhist concept of right livelihood. Martin Seligman, the father of positive psychology, devotes space in his best-selling book, Authentic Happiness, to exploring this as an approach to work. And then if you walk through any major bookstore in the US and look in the career section, you'll see books with titles like this, Live Your Calling, Let Your Life Speak, The Call. Of course, I cannot resist the urge to uh, <laughs> have my own, my own book here. Apparently, it's available in the back if you want to buy. Okay. Um, anyway, if you read these resources, you'll very quickly realize that people mean different things when they use the word calling. There's not one unified consensus definition, which is why Amy Resnesky, a management professor at Yale, uh, likens the concept of calling to a Rorschach inkblot. She says, um, like the Rorschach, the word calling is like an ambiguous stimulus, and people have different definitions of it, which probably reveals something about their worldview commitments. Now, I became interested in this topic about 10 years ago and have been doing empirical research uh, to try to understand uh, what does it look like for people who think of their work as a calling and what difference does it make in their lives compared to people with other approaches to work. I've approached a calling this way. I define it as, uh, at least within the work role, I don't think it's something that's necessarily limited to the work role, but that's often the context in which it's discussed and I'm a vocational psychologist, so that's where I choose to discuss it. In the work role, a calling is a transcendent summons to purposeful work that contributes something of value to society. It's similar to um, this famous quote by the author and theologian Frederick Buechner, who described a calling as the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Now, a lot of people say, a calling. Now that sounds pretty good. How do I figure out what mine is? How do I discern a calling? Now some people approach this question with the hope and expectation that they experience this. A Moses in the desert burning bush kind of experience. Because it's hard if you don't really have a clear sense of what your career path should be. It's very difficult often. And I was one of these people. I was an undergraduate who was interested in all kinds of different things. And the thought of choosing one, if it meant not choosing other things that were very appealing to me, was almost paralyzing. So I was one of these people who would have really valued a Moses in the desert kind of experience, an audible voice just telling me, this is where you should go. Or if not an audible voice, then a clear sense of conviction, this unmistakable knowledge that this is what I should do. Now, it's interesting, I've talked to many hundreds of people about their careers. And although I've talked to many people who say they're living their calling, I've only talked with two, two who have had a Moses in the desert kind of experience. One of them was this guy, Roger, Roger Visker. Uh, interestingly enough, he wasn't someone who was struggling with career decision making. He was actually well established in a career his whole life, from the time he was a child, he wanted to be a police officer. Everything about law enforcement just seemed to resonate with him. The badge, the uniform, the car, the feeling they must get from preserving the peace. He just loved this, and so he pursued a career as a, a police officer, went to college, got a degree in law enforcement, ended up getting a job in the police depart department in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is where I grew up. This is where I met Roger. And Roger, very quickly on the police force, he rose up the ranks. He was promoted rapidly. He was widely acknowledged as an excellent police officer. He had this knack for de-escalating tense situations. He had this perfect balance of firmness and fairness. He was good at what he, he, he did. And his supervisors acknowledged it and his peers acknowledged it. That's kind of hard to pull off. Anyway. One day he was having breakfast uh, on a Tuesday morning in September um, and he heard a voice. He heard a voice. I said, what do you mean you heard a voice? He said, I heard a voice. I looked across the table to see if someone was there. No one was there. I said, you heard a voice. He said, I don't know what to tell you, Brian. 
All I can tell you is I experienced it as if it were being spoken into my ears. Okay, so what did the voice say? The voice said, Roger, I want you to leave your job on the police force, and I want you to become a pastor. I'm pretty certain Roger has never worn one of these, but I was in need of a visual aid. Anyway, the voice then said, here is the name of the person who I want, uh, I want to replace you on the police force. And here are the names of seven people who I want you to talk with about this transition I'm asking you to make. And then the voice went away. Now, Roger was very flummoxed by this. He was upset. This was not what he was expecting and not really what he was hoping for. Uh, but he had to make sense of it. So he drove to the precinct that day to his office, uh, kind of wandered around in a daze, avoided eye contact with everyone, uh, and then drove back home for lunch where he saw his wife and he talked to his wife and he, and he told her this story. I think he was hoping that she would say, well, you know, we tried that new restaurant last night and you remember what the food was like and I think you might be having some kind of reaction to it. Or um, maybe you got a little bit too close to the evidence from that LSD raid. Um, <laughs> but what she said was, if this is what we're supposed to do, we'll figure it out. And Roger ultimately followed through with this transition and he's since served as a pastor at three different churches in three different states, and now he's a, um, on the staff of a very large church in Illinois. But remember, he was instructed by this voice to talk to seven people, to talk to seven people. And Roger said, I really didn't know what to ask them. I just told them what happened and then said, what do you think? And this is what he got from those seven people. So I have a table here, and you notice I have uh, what Roger received from the seven messengers I have seven messengers because it kind of sounds apocalyptic. Um, anyway, one thing he got was advice, a piece of advice saying, read, what color is your parachute? Now, is anyone here familiar with that book, What Color Is Your Parachute? Okay, a number of you are. This is the best-selling career self-help book of all time. It sold a few more copies than Make Your Job a Calling. Um, <laughs> he also got a piece of advice, I think you should meet with a career counselor and take some assessments. He got more advice, if you're being asked to transition into a role as a pastor, maybe you should talk to a pastor about what this is like. Then he got a lot of encouragement and affirmation. All seven of these people, they were not random strangers. They were, they were people in Roger's life who knew him and wanted the best for him, who were very supportive of him. Uh, and he also got modeling, and I don't mean super modeling, I mean role modeling, because he said, and this was very remarkable, all seven people had either gone through or were currently in the middle of a career change themselves. And so he could then ask them to describe for him what the challenges were like, how they coped with going through periods of time with very little income and all of that stuff that he was facing if he were to follow through. Now, years after I first heard this story from Roger, um, I was reading some research because I'm a psychologist, we're supposed to read research and do research and contribute. So I was doing that, I was doing my job. And I came across a meta-analysis. You know what a meta-analysis is? Are you familiar with that term? It's a study where somebody combs the research literature for every study they can find that addresses a single question, or at least a set of closely related questions. And then they provide a quantitative estimate of the overall effect across all of those studies in the literature about that question. And there was a group um, from University of Illinois, Chicago, or I'm sorry, University of Loyola, Chicago, different university. Anyway, they did a meta-analysis in which they were interested in two questions. Number one, do career interventions work? Do they help people? And by career interventions here, I mean individual career counseling, group counseling, career classes, online, career development interventions, these kinds of things. Do they help people? And then number two, if they help people, are, are some more effective than others? And the assumption is almost always these, the way these things work, some are more effective than others. So are there quote unquote critical ingredients that are included in the super effective career interventions that tend to be uh, not present in the ones that are less effective? 
And the answer to the first question that they found was yes, indeed, career interventions are very helpful for people compared to not participating in them. Uh, in fact, the, the size of the effects are just as large as what we see with general psychotherapy. The second thing was that they found there to be five critical ingredients that tended to be present in these interventions that were especially effective. And here's, here are those five. The first one is written goal setting exercises. So we know from psychology that goals are very helpful for people for organizing their behavior and motivating them. But there's something about committing them to writing that creates a sort of psychological contract um, with a person and herself or his, himself. Well, as it turns out, what color is your parachute is laden with written goal setting exercises. Okay? Now the second thing uh, that, the second critical ingredient are individualized interpretation and feedback. Individualized interpretation and feedback. And that's precisely what a person would get if they go to a career counselor and take some assessments. They would get individualized interpretation and feedback. The third thing is accurate occupational information. And that's precisely what Roger would get if he talked to a minister about what a career as a pastor looks like. The fourth thing is building support from important others, which is what Roger got from these seven messengers. And then finally, modeling. Uh, when individuals who are participating in career interventions have exposure to people who have successfully gone through the career decision-making process, and they identify with that person and they can learn from that person, it emboldens them. It makes them feel very confident that they too can do this. And of course, that's what Roger got since all seven of these people had gone through a career change. So I don't know about you, but for me, when I hear a story as surprising, but also profound as Roger's, and then I look at empirical research and I see this kind of convergence, then I start to pay attention. So when I talk to people who really want to experience a Moses in the desert kind of revelation of what their calling should be, um, I tell them, you can plead for that and wait for that, and patience is a virtue. But a better strategy is probably <laughs> to be active and engage in activity that can help you understand um, what your calling might be. And when I say be active, I mean these kinds of things, the things that are on the right side of, in the, in the table on the right. Now, a lot of this links to the concept of gifts. Remember Peter Parker? I have these gifts. What do I do with them? That ends up being a pretty powerful way to understand what type of career path we're best suited for. Now, this is a really old idea, too. Uh, in the Christian New Testament, there are a number of passages that address gifts that sound a little bit like this one um, from 1 Corinthians. It says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So this goes all the way back to the New Testament, the idea being that people are different from each other, and those differences matter. There are other passages that use the metaphor of the body, that the, in community we're all sort of parts, uh, different parts of one body, and one part can't say to the other, you're not important. All of them are important. They have to work together to support the well-being of the whole. Now, all of this stuff, this passage from Paul, was directed toward the church. But if you wanted to take these basic principles and generalize them to society as a whole, to general career decision making, you would be in good company. Uh, the Protestant reformers did this. Uh, Martin Luther uh, was among the first to say that any type of work, not just the work of priests or monks or nuns, can have spiritual significance if pursued in a way that is focused on glorifying God and serving our fellow person. Now, just as a quick aside, I happen to really like this picture of Martin Luther because he looks like a normal guy. I mean, I have students who stumble into my classroom who look exactly like this. You're probably more, you're probably more used to that. See what I mean with a hat and everything? That is a better picture. Anyway, 
John Calvin elaborated these ideas a, a little bit further, and then the Puritans, you know the Puritans, there are things about the Puritans that maybe weren't so good involving witch hunts and so forth, but they wrote very rich treatises about the role of work in human life. People like William Perkins and Richard Baxter, wearing their extremely uncomfortable looking clothes, uh, wrote these very rich treatises on the role of work in human life in which they tied the idea of calling to gifts to gifts, to strengths that people have that make them different, unique, different from other people. And one way of discerning callings they taught was by looking at your gifts. Just so you don't think this is exclusively a Protestant phenomenon, Pope John Paul in the early 1980s wrote an encyclic in which he drew many of these same conclusions. And like I said before, the Dalai Lama, in tying these, con these kinds of concepts to the Buddhist idea of right livelihood uh, ends up being on pretty much the same page. Now I should pause here and talk a little bit about this guy, Frank Parsons. Has anyone ever heard of Frank Parsons? Of course, Phil Wu in the back knows who Frank Parsons is. Um, but when I talk to Americans, they don't know who Frank Parsons is either. He's a very obscure person in history. But if you've studied career development, you've heard of him because he's widely regarded as the father of vocational guidance. Frank Parsons, the father of vocational guidance. Now, it is actually tremendously ironic that Frank Parsons is the father of vocational guidance. If you knew about his own career trajectory, Frank graduated at age 18 from Cornell University. It's an Ivy League school with a degree in engineering. That's pretty impressive. And then he got a job uh, with an engineering firm, but there was an economic downturn. And the company that he worked for failed, so he lost his job. He had to find something, so he latched on as a laborer in a steel mill. Now that's really hard work. And he wasn't the most strapping young lad. And so uh, he hated that job. And he quit as soon as he could. He retrained as a public school teacher and got a job teaching in the public schools in Boston. And then became active as a school teacher in the local literary society. Now some friends of his from the literary society said, Frank, you are a very skilled debater. You should consider a career in law. So he said, OK. <laughs> and he prepared for the bar exam. In those days, that's really all you had to do was prepare for the bar exam and pass it. He passed it, uh, but he worked so hard in preparation for the bar exam that he developed some kind of illness. It's not really clear from the history what all it consisted of, um, but because of that illness, upon medical advice, he moved to New Mexico, a desert region of the United States, to, quote, live in the open for three years. I have no idea what this <laughs> means or consisted of, but that's what he did. Lived in the open for three years. Then he moved back to Boston, got a job with a, a law firm, and then moonlighted as a lecturer at Boston University School of Law. Now, I would have liked to sit in on that interview. OK, Mr. Parsons, it looks like there's a little bit of a gap here. Uh, for the last three years, what were you doing in New Mexico? Um, after that. He decided he would become politically active, and he ran for mayor of Boston. And he lost with less than 1% of the vote. Decided he would move to what is now Kansas State University in a very rural part of the United States, where he taught social science and was fired after three years because he got in some disagreements with uh, his administrators. Finally, he moved back to Boston and persuaded a wealthy philanthropist to fund the Vocation Bureau, the Vocation Bureau of Boston. This was a social service in Boston's North End that was designed by Parsons to provide services, job training and career decision-making services, to some of the immigrants in Boston who were underemployed and, as a result, idle and getting into lots of trouble. Now, the Vocation Bureau opened in January of 1908. Frank Parsons presided over the opening, but then six months after that, he developed an illness. And three months after that, he died from a kidney infection. 
This, friends, is our father of vocational guidance. His own career path can only be described as a chaotic pattern of trial and error, <laughs> and his actual experience providing vocational guidance consisted of a grand total of about six months. But Frank did a lot of writing, and after he died, his friends gathered some of his writings, published them in a skinny little book called Choosing a Vocation. And buried in that book is what has become a very important quote for people who study career development. And the quote goes like this, in the wise choice of a vocation, there are three broad factors. Number one, a clear understanding of all of these different aspects of yourself. Number two, a knowledge of all of these different aspects of the world of work. And number three, true reasoning on the relation of these two groups of facts. And of course, that's where the rubber hits the road. But it's this very deceptively simple three-part model. Understand yourself and how you're unique. Understand opportunities that are available or potentially available to you in the world of work. And then number three, try to make a match. Now this idea, embedded in this concept of gifts as described in the New Testament, was developed by Puritans and agreed upon by the Pope and the Dalai Lama. Um, it's stated very succinctly here by Frank Parsons, our ironic father of vocational guidance. And I should tell you that researchers have investigated this for the better part of four decades. They've looked at this idea of fit. How well does the degree of fit between a person and their work environment, how well does that predict outcomes, like how satisfied people are? And as it turns out, researchers from the University of Iowa um, did another meta-analysis where they found every study they could looking at different levels of person-environment fit. And what we find is that person PJ fit, that's person job fit, is closely associated with job satisfaction. So the, the better the fit between a person and her or his job, the more satisfied that person is likely to be. It happens on the organizational level. That's PO fit, person organization fit, has a pretty robust correlation with organizational commitment. So the better the fit you are with your organization, the more committed you are to it. It happens on the team level. So the closer the fit you are with your coworkers, the more satisfied you are with them. And even on the dyad level, PS fit, that's person supervisor fit, the closer the fit, the more satisfied a person is with their supervisor. All of that is to say, this stuff seems to matter. This stuff seems to matter. So how do I discern my calling? I usually tell people, understand what your gifts are. Understand what makes you unique, what you've been entrusted with in that sense, and figure out opportunities and needs in the world that you might be best suited to address. So by gifts, when, psycho when psychologists use the term, they talk about things like this. What things are you most passionate about? That refers to your interests. What things are really important to you? That refers to your work values. What things are you unmistakably good at? Okay, we're talking about your strengths, your abilities. And then how do people experience you, right? What's your personality? What are your traits, your general tendencies and ways of behaving? When you look ahead, what opportunities will best permit you to be who you are, to express your gifts, and what needs in the world are you best suited to address? That harkens back to that Beekner quote, a calling is a place where your deep gladness and the world's great hunger meet. Okay, so what's so good about having a calling? I'm telling you how to discern a calling, but do you really want to do that? What's, what difference does it make for people who have a calling? Now, this is a question that psychologists get excited about, because if a calling is something that we can actually measure, then we can use the methods of science to come up with answers to this question, right? Of course, in order to do that, you have to come up with a way of measuring a calling, and actually, in my lab, we've done that. The calling and vocation questionnaire. This is the measurement model. I will spare you the technical details involved in scale development, but I did want to at least have the measurement model on the screen because it has a certain symmetric elegance, doesn't it? 
Don't you think it's aesthetically pleasing? I could just stare at it. Uh, I have a picture of it in my living room. No, I don't, but, uh, but I could. If you colored it, it would look very beautiful. Okay. So what difference does it make? Well, as it turns out, people who score high on uh, the measure that we developed of a sense of calling, and there are a number of others in the literature, people who score high on these also score high on other measures of related variables um, that tell us things about the difference that it makes. So as it turns out, people with a calling are more confident and comfortable in their career decisions. They're happier at work than people with other approaches to their work. They're more committed to their careers. They're more committed to their organizations. They put in more effort at work. And not only are the benefits um, that are associated with a sense of calling, not only do they occur in a work environment, but also people who approach their work as a calling say that their lives are more meaningful. Their lives as a whole are more meaningful than people with other approaches to work, and they're happier with their lives in general. So a sense of calling seems to make a difference, or at least it's associated with all kinds of beneficial characteristics for people. Now, an interesting twist in the last few years, researchers have noted that it doesn't seem to really only be about having a calling. You have to actually find opportunities to live it. These are not the same thing. It's actually possible to identify a sense of calling, to perceive one, but yet, for whatever reason, not be in a position where you're living it out. And when people have measured both of these things, they find that the positive and strong relationship between having a calling and well-being, when they statistically account for living a calling, that relationship goes away. Just meaning to say that the relationship between having a calling and well-being, uh, one reason that it's there is because many people who have a calling find opportunities to live it. And when they're living it, they tend to be doing pretty well in terms of their well-being. Now, a lot of the research I just shared with you comes from samples collected within the United States. Right? But in the last few years, there has been a global effort to conduct research on calling within other countries. Now, this is very new. Um, actually, research on calling itself is very new uh, within psychology. Um, but within the last five years in particular, we've seen at least a dozen additional countries um, researchers are collecting data there. So, for example, U.S., but also Australia, Canada, China, Germany, India, Israel, New Zealand, Romania, South Africa, South Korea, Zambia. And there's at least one study that included an internet sample with people representing about 70 nations. Um, I know for a fact there also has been data collected on calling within um, Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, soon to be, or maybe in the process of Indonesia, and soon these will be published, and we'll talk about that also. Uh, what's interesting about research on calling in these different national contexts is that thus far, the similarities seem to be more striking than the differences. For example, um, a group of researchers in China tried to construct a scale to measure a sense of calling with Chinese college students, and they found that the best fitting measurement model had three dimensions. What were those dimensions? A guiding force, a sense of meaning and purpose, and altruism, uh, some kind of pro-social orientation. Now I saw this and I was kind of excited because these are the same um, definitions that are embedded in the, or the same dimensions that are embedded in the definition that orients my work related to this topic. Transcendent summons, guiding force toward purposeful work, meaning and purpose that serves the greater good, altruism. So there's a lot more research that's needed, um, but so far I think it's provocative to see this kind of convergence even across cultures. And of course Viktor Frankl is famous for arguing that the search for meaning is a human universal. And to the extent that approaching one's work as a calling is an attempt to experience meaning, um, it's perhaps unsurprising that we see this kind of convergence across different cultures. 
But what if I make the wrong choice and miss my calling? Some people think this way, like a sense of calling is something that you can get wrong. This is actually related to the concept of the soulmate. You identify with this romantic concept of the soulmate? Maybe there's one person out there for me in this world, probably another student at Hong Kong U. <laughs> and if I miss this person and make the wrong choice, I'll be doomed to a life of misery. Well, some people think about this as a calling. If I make the wrong choice, I choose the wrong major, or I take the wrong job, then I'm kind of screwed. And I'll be stuck in this, um, this place doing this drudgery kind of job and, and be miserable, and maybe there's something else that I just totally missed. That's conveyed in this obituary that was published in The Onion. Now, The Onion, if you're not familiar with it, is a satirical newspaper in the United States. I have to say that it's satirical because um, just to convey that it's all fake news. It's fake news that's designed to be funny, okay? So this is not real. But it conveys this idea, okay? So Nancy Hollander, 97-year-old dies unaware of being violin prodigy. Usually if you read The Onion, all you need to read is the headlines. That's the funny part. You don't really have to read the article. But this one, it's worth reading some of the text. So, Rockford, Illinois, retired police office branch manager Nancy Hollander, 97, died at her home of natural causes Tuesday after spending her life completely unaware that she was one of the most talented musicians of the past century and possessed the untapped ability to become a world-class violin virtuoso. This is kind of depressing. <laughs> she is survived by her family, all of whom will forever remain oblivious to the national treasure Hollander would have become had she just picked up a violin, even once. Her son says, we're really going to miss mom. She was such a gentle, sensitive, perceptive person, he said, unknowingly outlining qualities that would have infused his mother's interpretation of Mendelssohn's violin concerto with a singular haunting beauty capable of moving the most jaded of souls. Now. Does it really work this way? Like, is it possible that inside you is somewhere deep this um, latent ability that you're in danger of completely missing out on that would make you some kind of international superstar? I don't think so. I don't think it works that way. Partly I don't think so because a sense of calling is not really something that you find in the end. It's something that you build. It's something that you create. Now, when we were designing our calling and vocation questionnaire, we actually had two, um, we had a number of subscales, but two of them were seeking a calling and having a calling. The idea is that some people feel that they have a calling. Other people maybe sense, it, well, some people feel they have a calling, they know what it is. Other people feel like maybe they have a calling, but they don't know what it is yet. So they're searching for it, right? And what we thought was that if people are searching for a calling, it's because they don't have it yet. And if they're searching for it and they find it, then they would stop searching for it because now they have it. But then we looked at the correlations between these scales that we developed to measure these things. And what we found was that our CVQ, Calling and Vocation Questionnaire Search Scale, correlated with the calling and vocation questionnaire present scale at a magnitude of 0.77. Now, um, if you're rusty with your statistics, the highest a correlation can be is 1.0 or negative 1.0, but this is positive, so 1.0. 0. 0.77 is so close to 1.0, it conveys that you're essentially looking at the same construct, right? Now this was distressing to us initially because we realized that our data failed to conform to our neat logic. But eventually, after feeling sorry for ourselves a little bit, we decided we should approach this like real scientists and try to make sense of it. And of course, it eventually occurred to us that a sense of calling is an ongoing process. It's not something to be found and then possessed. It's not like you lose your keys when you're sitting on the couch and they get buried in the cushions. 
And then you have to dig through until you find it. And then once you find it, you stop looking for it because now you have it. Instead, a sense of calling is an ongoing process. It's this process of always continually asking yourself, am I doing everything I can do to use my gifts to make a meaningful difference in the world around me? Right? You might come up with an answer to that question today, but tomorrow you ask it anew. Today, is there something else I can be doing that would better allow me to use my gifts to make a meaningful difference in the world around me? Some of this is conveyed in some recent research within management on a concept called job crafting. This is that it, the idea that we are not passive recipients of our work experiences. Rather, we are active shapers of it. To me, this is conveyed in this person, Maggie Garza. Okay? She's a 62-year-old hospital janitor. Now, I have four children, all boys, ages 4, 7, 9, and 11. Our house is always trashed. But anyway, when the third one was born, we were in the hospital, and our favorite person very quickly became Maggie Garza. She was the custodian who was assigned to our room. She had a job description that consisted of cleaning surfaces, mopping the floor, emptying the garbage, these kinds of things. But she was our favorite person because she seemed to experience genuine joy upon interacting with our baby. She also expressed what seemed to be genuine empathy toward my wife who was still experiencing the lingering pain from childbirth. She would share with us about her family and we felt a kind of kinship with her, a bond. Now later, as I was walking around the floor, because if you're in the hospital for several days, you get bored. Uh, I was walking around the hallways. I um, interacted with some of the doctors and nurses. And we actually happened to be in overflow space. It was a very, or at least nine months prior, it was a very busy time for people. Uh, anyway, a lot of babies were born, so they put us on the pediatrics ward. And um, Maggie was usually on this floor with small children who were patients. And I asked the nurses and the doctors about Maggie, just kind of sharing uh, our experience of her. And they said, you know, here's the thing about Maggie. You don't even realize this. She's a janitor, but when we struggle with a kid uh, who's really hurting and we're trying to provide medical care, but the kid is just squirming and is restless, we will call Maggie into the room to break the ice. And she will crawl around on the floor and purr like a kitten. And the kid starts laughing. And the parents starts, start laughing. And there's a lighter environment. And now everyone can provide high quality health care. That's job crafting. Because that's not part of her job description. But relationships are important to Maggie. And not only that, when I talked to her about her work, she said, my job is providing health care. I'm a janitor, but I see how the work that I do connects to this broader purpose, this mission that the hospital has of helping sick people get well. Now, I don't know about you, but when I encounter people like Maggie, who clearly derive all kinds of meaning and purpose from her work, but who are in a role that, frankly, very few people grow up aspiring to fill, right? I ask myself, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for me in the work that I do? And what does it mean for us in the work that all of us are preparing for? I'm going to end this way um, with this very simple anecdote. I did not write it. Uh, I did write it, but I did not invent it. Um, it goes like this. Three workers were breaking up rocks. And they were asked to describe what it was they were doing. And the first one said, I'm making little ones out of big ones. And the second one said, I'm making a living. And the third one said, I'm building a cathedral. And that's really the question I want to leave you with. What cathedral is it that you're building? What cathedral is it that you're building? If you're able to articulate how the work that you do connects to a broader sense of purpose and meaning, then you will personally experience purpose and meaning. Thanks very much.
And if there's time for questions, yes, I think there, there is. is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, Brian. That was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. So we have about uh, 15 minutes uh, for uh, questions and free career advice. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just to remind you, three things, A, B, C. A, please be articulate. So please formulate a very clear question. And we have mics that will be given to you. So wait for a mic to come before you ask your question. B, please be brief. Make your question short and sweet. Uh, this is not a time for a long uh, question because we're not going to work overtime tonight. And thirdly, C, be centered. Uh, please focus on the issues that were raised in the lecture today. So those are the three things you have to keep in mind. So uh, put your hands up if you have uh, questions to ask Brian. So there's a question there. So there's a question over there, yes. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned that, um, among other nations, um, they're doing similar research more recently, um, and they're finding similar, um, I guess, results to what you found. Yeah. Um, but uh, from experience with other people, especially in Hong Kong, where there are a good number of expats, mm -hmm. um, taking, say, what you've been doing in one country and then transferring to another um, has been found to not exactly be the same fit or the same amount of job satisfaction. So I was wondering uh, what your thoughts were on, like what what are the causes and uh, what could be done to, I guess, um, adjust? Okay, well, um, I will say, although the similarities are more striking than the differences is how I put it. That's not to say that there aren't differences. Uh, in um, an, an earlier, sample using a qualitative approach with uh, Chinese uh, students, there was a comparison made between them and American students. American students tend to bring up religion when they respond to this question about calling. Chinese students didn't do that hardly at all. Instead, they were more likely to refer to a sense of duty, which was something that Americans didn't really talk about too much. So even though at the level of these broad themes there were a lot of similarities, there were still some differences. So I wouldn't say there are no differences. I expect, especially across uh, countries with collectivist values, you may see a greater emphasis on kind of the more pro-social aspects of this. And within countries with individualist values, you might see a greater emphasis on personal meanings. Um, but your question about transferring type of work from one country or context to another, um, and that being disruptive for people, just highlights a bigger point which I didn't really have time to get into, is the idea that the fit is dynamic. It's not static. So even something that might be a, uh, a good fit at one point in time, there's no guarantee that it's going to maintain um, its status as a good fit. In fact, if there was any kind of guarantee, it's that it would likely change and um, fluctuate a little bit. And to me, that just highlights um, the importance of having an ongoing process of continually evaluating and crafting your work experience in order to um, move things into closer alignment. Now, it's difficult, and it requires a lot of effort, and it's helpful if you do that in the context of a lot of support. Um, but um, it, is, it is possible to kind of move things into greater alignment when they get out of whack. And of course, in some circumstances, something is just such a bad fit that a transition into a completely different environment might be um, required. And it takes some wisdom to discern when that might be, which is um, just sort of another reason why leaning on the support from other people can be really helpful. But that hopefully addresses the spirit of your question anyway. Yeah. Uh, another question? Oh, there's one there. And there's one here as well, so we can get a microphone here. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It's interesting that about the concept or the construct of calling. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm thinking uh, whether the con construct of calling can apply to Chinese society. Uh, because in, in, uh, uh, for, for me, the calling, the, this concept is a quite um, Christian or a Catholic understanding because the, call, the God called us to do something. But mm -hmm. in China or in Chinese society, we, our God, we, 
will never call us to do something, but uh -huh. the society or the people will call the God to do something for us. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. so, so it's interesting that uh, actually I'm, I'm, I'm studying a teacher uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, I, I try to understand why they want to be a teacher and what, and what make them feel happy about teaching. And most of my sample uh, on from my informants uh, didn't tell me, oh, this is a kind of calling except to uh, have a religious background. They just call us up because uh, they, they may think oh, this is a mission for them to do something. They want to uh, um, contribute to society, etc., etc. But they, they use they didn't use the, you know, the term calling to, to, to explain their aspiration and something yeah, like yeah. that. So I'm, I'm thinking, uh, I'm, not say, uh, I'm not saying that uh, your analysis or your framework is totally invalid to understand the Chinese society, but I'm just thinking uh, if, if or, or to what degree can we use the calling, this concept of the understanding to explain the Hong Kong or Chinese issue? issue? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so the, uh, I worked with a group from within China who, um, I believe the word that they used when they initially started asking students to describe how they understood the concept was Ximing. My Chinese pronunciation is terrible. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, a, I'm an American. We are pathetically monolingual. Um, so that's about the best I can do with with my Chinese. But anyway, um, I appreciate what you're saying. Um, you know, there, the term calling has religious connotations because it has a religious uh, heritage, I guess. It, it, in a sense, it emerged from within a religious tradition. Um, but the concept itself is, has evolved, and I think it's sufficiently robust that it's not something that's limited to one particular religious perspective. Now, when we have done research with different samples within the U.S., we consistently see that among people who are religious, uh, it is very common um, that people resonate with the concept. But among people who don't have a religious affiliation or who maybe say they are spiritual but not religious, which is increasingly common in the U.S., um, they still describe a calling as something that's um, desirable to them, that's valuable to them. And if you take the name of the term out of it and just look at the dimensions itself, kind of like what you mentioned, the idea of uh, especially experiencing a sense of meaning in purpose, if we can think about that as a human universal, um, then it makes sense that there would be um, resonance across cultures and also the idea of giving back. Um, so I don't really know how to respond to the last part of your question, like what can be done uh, I, if, I, if I remember it or interpreted it uh, in my head correctly, some, sometimes I've been told I have a way of answering the question I want to, I want to answer, not the one that was actually asked. Um, uh, I, I think the, the answer to, to that is, um, is to turn it back to you and say, given your knowledge of yourself and your coworkers and colleagues, um, if, if you think that these characteristics are desirable and are something that can provide value within the culture here, um, then what kinds of things can you do to help um, share this or promote it among people so that um, they can think about their work as more than a means to a paycheck or a way to um, work themselves to death, but instead as, as a, a pathway or using their gifts to make a meaningful contribution to the world around them. I think if everybody did that, by the way, the world would be happier, you know, and individuals would too. But there's a question here. Yeah. Um, I just wonder if a successful career change always go through the five critical steps of um, career intervention you mentioned earlier. So, for example, if I'm a, I want to be a clinical psychologist, I know something about the job, but I never have a chance to talk to someone that's clinical psychology. So, do you suggest that I hold that career change until oh. I really talk to that person? Uh, well, the, the answer to your first question, I think, is um, no. Uh, people make successful career changes without using all five of those critical ingredients. 
It's just my point was that research tells us that um, using those, doing those activities uh, or experiencing those things increases the chances that a career change will be successful, right, or will be satisfying. So in your specific example about clinical psychologists, I wouldn't necessarily say, no, don't do anything until you talk to a clinical psychologist. It, it might really kind of depend on who that person is that you talk to also. <laughs> I'm just saying that the more information you gather that can inform your decision, um, the more confident you will be in making that decision. And uh, you know, the more information that's in play, it increases the odds that we're uh, making a decision wisely. So, yeah, good question. Another question? There's so one here. Oh, you have a microphone over there already. Okay, there's a person over um, there. And then th there's a person in a red T-shirt here. And I think that may have to be the last questions. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, good evening, Professor. Thank you for sh sharing. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier on that the pursuit of a calling is actually an ongoing process. Yeah. And according to the formulation of Frank Parsons, it's actually involving the understanding of yourself and the understanding of, well, perhaps the career or the things that you want to do. So um, according to that formulation, actually both elements are subject to changes over time. Yeah. So do you, or from in your opinion or from your studies, um, do you think that a calling is something that is subject to change or is it just a static concept which is yet to be explored in a correct interpretation? Uh, I do think it's subject to change. I think if, if you talk to people, um, and I've, I, I have a PhD student who's doing her dissertation on, on people who are in the process of making career changes, some of them from what they considered to be a calling at one point to a new pathway that they also considered to be a calling, which is kind of interesting from one calling to another. Um, I don't think it really makes sense to think of there being one calling in your life that will always um, be the same and never change. I think it, um, the part about it being an ongoing process means there's an openness to um, experiencing some changes. Now Parsons, his definition was, you know, in the wise choice of a vocation there are three broad factors. The idea of understanding yourself, those things that he'd listed there, there is actually evidence that those things on average are fairly stable. The specific ways that they're expressed, people's values, interests, personality, the specific ways that they're expressed may differ, but on kind of a trait level, they're pretty stable over time. So if you're really interested in the arts when you're 18, if we fast forwarded to when you're 70, you'll still probably be pretty interested in the arts. It might be different arts, you know, classical music instead of video games, I don't know. Uh, but that artistic interest will still be there. So. Um, I don't want to, I'm just saying that because I don't want to convey that it's totally chaotic and it might be totally different every day and gathering information about what we're like now might be absolutely useless for a decision that, you know, has long-term consequences. I don't want to say that that's the case, but uh, I do think it makes sense to, even with the decisions we're making now, maintain an openness for changes to, be, uh, to occur in the future. And when we make career changes later, that doesn't mean that we made the wrong choice earlier, right? It just means, it may mean that we made the right choice at the time that we made it, but things took their course and um, it had come to an end and now it's time for something new. And that's normal and natural and can be embraced. Thank you. Yeah. Our last question. Um, good evening, Professor Dick. So I, uh, my question is uh, quite quick. So you've been talking about the good consequences of espousing a sense of calling in yeah. our lives. Uh, what about the antecedents? Uh, uh, have you found some um, relatively um, stable antecedents of a sense of calling? Antecedents, you mean like what comes before it? What yeah, causes yeah, like it? what would be some predictors of higher sense of calling? <laughs> That's a great question and it's actually, um, well, earlier today I gave a, a, a research colloquium where I talked about some um, kind of next steps. And with research on calling right now, again, it's, uh, it's about 10 years old. Um, there are about 100 studies. Um, that's a lot of studies, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not really all that many. There's a lot more that we don't know than that we know. 
And one of the things that you know, we know a lot about what a calling is associated with, what the correlates are, and there are a few longitudinal studies that show what a sense of calling predicts, but there's really very little on what contributes to a sense of calling, right? Um, so that's something that research needs to examine. Now I think you can probably think through some things, um, personal values, um, and, you know, role models, uh, and there are a few studies that looked at what people describe as influences on their sense of calling, um, but that's something that more research is needed to be able to, for me to be able to answer that with more confidence. Thank you. Yeah. I'm afraid we've run out of time, but before we go, I'm sure we're all very grateful that um, Brian has found his calling and <laughs> <laughs> has given us such a wonderful lecture. So thank you very much, Brian. That was thank absolutely you. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And his book is available at the back. <laughs>